Good evening, everyone. My name is Philip Jackson. I'm the vicar here at Trinity Wall Street. On behalf of Dr. Bill Lupfer, our rector and the vestry and the Congregational Council, uh, I've been asked to introduce our speaker tonight, our guest speaker, Father Richard Rohr. Ladies and gentlemen, Father Richard Rohr. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. He promised me he'd make it short, and he did. Thank you. It's so embarrassing when they go on and on, and you all know it's only half true. So I get to talk on a subject that really is quite easy to talk on. The title we took from a conference we had in Albuquerque uh, last September called The Francis Factor, and that's how in the first publications it said part two or something, I don't know. This isn't going to be part two, it's going to be part one, I think. Uh, but there I was trying to put together the spiritual genius of Francis of Assisi with the spiritual genius of Pope Francis. And so the Francis factor was referring, of course, to both of them. Uh, I think tonight I'd like to largely con concentrate on Pope Francis, because quite honestly, uh, my admiration of him increases almost day by day. Maybe you heard uh, some of the commentators, this was some months ago, I think it was on CNN, uh, and one commentator said, I don't know anybody in all my years of journalism that says something quotable every day. <laughs> and the other one looks at, that's true, you know, <laughs> every day. Now they're putting out his his daily homilies from the little masses he has there in Vatican City in this small chapel. And even those, there's, there's no cliches. There's no, you know, I think we all got used to bishops and priests saying predictable things. Uh, he doesn't. He, he's not predictable at all. And of course, that's scaring an awful lot of folks. But I gave one talk recently where I just asked the question, can a pope also be a prophet? And I think that's what we're dealing with. I really think he has, and if you want to ask me afterwards what I fully mean by that, you're, you're free to. I think he has the prophetic charism. And the prophetic charism is the ability to criticize positively from the inside. Huh? So the Jewish prophets were still Jewish. They didn't reject their Jewish religion but they critiqued it <laughs> in a, a way that few others were allowed to critique. Because you can only fittingly criticize anything from the inside. It's too easy to throw rocks from the outside. And I think that's in some ways why I've gotten away with criticizing Catholicism. Uh, because if I can put it this way, I sort of paid my dues to Catholicism. and. Uh, once they know that you, you're talking about the inner experience of the organization or the institution, you've sort of earned the right to speak. And that increases the older you get, this great gift of seniority, uh, which Pope Francis certainly enjoys too, uh, helps an awful lot. It's now generally agreed <clears throat> that uh, when Pope Benedict was elected, that Francis was the second in the running. And I don't know if it was second vote or third vote, I don't know how many there were, but he sent word to his own delegation, if you want to call it that, switch to Benedict, uh, I don't need to be Pope. And that's precisely what you want in a Pope, someone who doesn't need to be Pope. <laughs> I think that's what you need in any spiritual leader, they don't want the role too much or too bad. What I'd like to do is give just a little bit of history that uh, shows his very election uh, was, was so unpredictable and unexpected. Some of you are perhaps familiar with this quote from the English poet William Wordsworth, and he's reflecting back in the mid-1800s on the French Revolution in 1789. 
when he was a young, I guess, 20-year-old boy. And this is the quote. It's in a poem. I can't remember the name of the poem. For those of us who were strong in love, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. But the, to be young was very heaven. To be young in a time when the world is opening up. Now, those of you of my generation, I'm about to turn 73, uh, I, I, maybe we romanticize it too much, but that was the 1960s. Uh, to be young was pure heaven. It was like everything was opening up. We were allowed to talk about uh, the war-like country we had become, and we, we weren't allowed to think that way. We were allowed to name that we had become a racist society. And, uh, you know, we happily jumped on board with the civil rights movement and the war against poverty. It was like things that in the 1950s were totally hidden in the shadow, unspeakable, were suddenly speakable by the mid to late 60s. Well, the reason I begin with that is I believe um, that's how we Catholics felt, many of us, probably not all, I'm sure, in the mid-1960s, when we had this magnificent event called the Second Vatican Council. I don't care what denomination you're from. If you would go to a bookstore tonight and buy the documents of the Second Vatican Council, you would, you would say, who wrote these? <laughs> this sounds so contemporary. This sounds so enlightened, so aware, so... Uh, ecumenical, so it wasn't just beating the Catholic drum, but it was beating the Catholic drum with a little c, which you Episcopalians understand. <clears throat> and um, 50 years later, those documents still stand. Uh, any good theologian would be proud to own them as very good statements on the various aspects of, of Christianity. So I enjoy that pure heaven for a number of years, and probably it's the only reason I was able to start the New Jerusalem community in Cincinnati, and my early talks were put out on cassette tapes, and they used to introduce me as the cassette priest. For years I was called the cassette priest. But I wouldn't have gotten away with that 10 years earlier or 10 years later. Because even though Vatican II was this magnificent opening onto the whole world, not just the other Christian denominations, but the other religions of the world. Whenever you have something like the French Revolution, whenever freedom is exalted, certain as the dawn is Napoleon. Do you understand? Something is going to come and push back. It's the story of history, for those of you who are at all historians. Humanity can't handle very much freedom. And I think it's no secret, I'm not trying to be cruel or unfair, but uh, the magnificent documents of, of Vatican II and uh, the Pope who was still in at that time, Paul VI, who tried to hold it as best he could, the immense rebellion that set in, uh, the next two popes, without any doubt, pulled back, pulled back, pulled back. Again, overly centralized, all the decisions in Rome, a, kind of, a new kind of obsession with verbal orthodoxy and liturgical orthodoxy. Uh, sometimes I'm amazed that I wasn't kicked out, uh, but I, I was fortunate that I always had the protection of the Franciscans. And that makes sense too, and let me talk a little bit about that. If you're not raised in the Catholic Church, there might be a few things that would never have occurred to you. And one of them is that the reason this massive institution has survived is because, in fact, it had a lot of exhaust valves. And those exhaust valves were the religious orders. Abbots of Benedictine monasteries had the same authority as a bishop, even though they weren't bishops. Provincials are our superiors of 
sisters' communities and friars' communities. Uh, they, are, they are equals to bishops, but there's a big difference. Ours are elected. They're not appointed. Sounds like the Episcopal Church to some degree. Huh? Uh, well, that changes everything. In the uh, 70s, I was still allowed to give the early 70s retreats to bishops and to provincials and all, and I wasn't considered so scary or threatening. But already by the early 80s, those invitations began to stop because people felt, rightly or wrongly, uh, I wasn't speaking the party line. And uh, the trouble is the party line became more and more, uh, what's the word? Uh, narrow, uh, in-house language. It was all in-house language as we circled the wagons around ourselves. One of the wonderful quotes that Pope Francis just gave us a few weeks ago when he was addressing the Italian bishops, deeply challenging them to change. He said, this is not just an era of change, it's a change of era. <laughs> he is immensely aware that what is happening in the world is larger than life. And if the globalization of knowledge, the globalization of communications uh, uh, isn't going to change us, uh, uh, it already is changing us, probably to a degree that we ourselves do not realize where it's going to lead. What it comes down to is we cannot have ignorance of one another. We cannot believe the myths that maybe you believed about us or we believed about you, even though Episcopalians were always our first cousins. We, we come to your services and we think, well, it looks Catholic to me, you know. You wonder why we created such distinctions. But uh, someone said, oh, I think I said this. <laughs> <Here>. <laughs> Pope Francis is the spiritual equivalent of the falling of the Berlin Wall, you know. I, 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 that's not an exaggeration, I don't think, you know. He's changed the conversation for people who are listening to the conversation. The Economist, which I think is a more or less conservative magazine, I don't know, said, calls Pope Francis a turnaround CEO of the oldest and most embedded institution in Western civilization. A turnaround CEO of the oldest and most embedded institution in Western civilization. In another place, I called him a one-man Vatican II. So we had Vatican II, then we pulled back on it for 25 years while not admitting we were pulling back on it sort of like politicians do. You say, no, I'm not, but you clearly are. But the shadow is not owned. Well, we weren't owning our shadow very well through the 80s and 90s. And it's almost as if, I'm not saying God caused the pedophilia scandal, but it was made to order to humble the arrogance of our church. It was made to order. To, and not just humble the church as a whole, but particularly the clericalism, the clerical culture that so many of the bishops and priests we lived inside of. But you've got to know, and I'm sure you do know, because this was said in many magazines, that when Pope Francis, a Jesuit, took the name Francis, I, I can remember watching uh, St. Peter's Square that night and people saying, Oh, he means St. Francis Xavier. He's a Jesuit. He certainly means St. Francis Xavier. And then when he was there, he says, no, no, I mean Francis of Assisi. Now, why had no one ever taken the name Francis of Assisi? Because he's an anti-establishment saint. <laughs> so that's why we have this amazing admixture of the ultimate establishment figure, the, the Pope, with Francis, who... who stayed outside the systems of power in every way that he could. He would not even accept ordination. A lot of Catholics assume Francis was a priest. He refused to be ordained a priest because he knew, and I know the priests here recognize this, the great temptation to, to hone your message down to what is acceptable. 
It's, it's a great temptation because you'll be promoted. <laughs> By the way, Pope Francis calls clericalism. Clericalism is the church form of patriarchy. Huh? He calls it the cancer, the cancer of the Catholic Church. This, this holding of all the power by the celibate males, and that it's lasted this long. So before he was elected, and this makes his election all the more amazing, uh, he spoke to the cardinals and he said, the church is sick. I, I don't know how they elected him. It's wrapped up in itself. It's suffering a kind of theological narcissism. All that tells me is how, oops, how bad the situation must really be, or whatever report they got before the conclave, that they would elect a man who was that critical of the church before he was elected. In his final talk, he was trying to assure that he wouldn't be elected <laughs> by being that critical. I've got a whole page of things he said in that talk. There's a tension between the center and the periphery. We must get out of ourselves and go toward the periphery. We must avoid the spiritual disease of the church that is always self-referential. He popularized that phrase, self-referential. When this happens, the church becomes sick. It's true that accidents can happen when you go out into the street as can happen to any man or woman. But if the church itself remains closed into itself, self-referential, it will quickly grow old, and it already has. Between a church that goes into the streets and gets into an accident and a church that is sick with itself, I have no doubt I prefer the first. <laughs> so the quote that you've probably heard is, you know, I want a church that gets dirty, and that smells like the sheep. <laughs> I guess you're supposed to be the sheep if you're a laity, but what he's saying is a bad smell isn't something you gotta get away from. This, all these purity codes that low-level religion creates is really a, a pretense of the ego. So uh, Elton John even calls him a miracle of humility. Elton John. <laughs> A miracle of humility in an age of vanity. And I think we saw this response when he visited our country in September. We're just not used to humility. Humility is not an American virtue. Let's be honest about it. It isn't. We admire grandiosity. Some of our politicians are making that rather clear, huh? That it's actually admired to brag and to talk about how wonderful you are and, and so forth. To have someone 180 degrees in the other direction literally is blowing our mind, you know? Uh, how could this happen? How did this happen? So the Roman church, since its imperial beginnings in 313, uh, that's the, the turning point. And which made the, the Protestant Reformations inevitable and certain. Because after 313, becoming more, much more solidified by 325, when we became the established religion of the Roman Empire, uh, church and state were one. They were all the same. And once we got in bed with war and power and money, and our, our bishops to this day dress like, uh, you know, princes, in fact, we call them princes of the church. It's pretty clear who we identified with. You know, I remember when I studied history, uh, and uh, I don't know how we got into French history, but uh, the Estates General in France, there was the left and the right. And our terms left and right to this day come from the Estates General in France. And on the right, maintaining authority, the status quo, the tradition, the ancien regime, uh, were, guess who, right? The nobility and the clergy sat on the right. I just gave the staff a little talk about change. Uh, when you're comfortable, you're never for change, never. <laughs> why would you be? That's why change always has to come from the minorities 
from those who suffer, for those who are excluded. That's why we've got to go to the periphery for our own transformation, for our own enlightenment. You can't be too comfortable at the center of anything or you build it basically around yourself. On the left, in the Estates General in, in France, sat the hoi polloi, the people, the ordinary folks. And I just wanted, thought already then, this was somewhere in college, oh, what are the clergy doing over there with the nobility? <laughs> Nothing against nobility, maybe some of you are noble. Uh, but that sure wasn't Jesus' position. That's pretty obvious. It's overwhelmingly obvious. Sometime, I want you to go through the four Gospels and take your highlighter, maybe it's an old Bible, and every passage in the four Gospels that seemed to be critical of the rich or the powerful or the moneyed and complimentary of the poor, just highlight it, right? And you're going to be amazed where Jesus' agenda is going. And it's not money per se that's the evil, it's power. As soon as the ego aligns itself with power, it cannot see the truth. It will be preoccupied, as much of our country is right now, with its own security, to protect what I have, and I can disobey any deeper laws of the gospel to protect what I have. Because that's all I have in a materialistic society, is my body, my health, uh, my prestige or whatever else it might be. So once we switch sides in the fourth century, the, the tangent for the next 1700 years became pretty clear, that we were identified with power and money and war and not the suffering of the world. Even though, and here's the irony, we kept the logo of the crucified, you know, you know, it's still hanging, usually, and it's jeweled now, though, you see. We don't necessarily see the suffering Christ. We make it a logo. It's pretty. And that is pretty. I'm not against it, you know. But um, to really show a naked, bleeding, losing man is a little bit embarrassing and probably a little bit Roman Catholic, I suppose. But um, that is our logo. That is our message that everything is signed with the cross. You cannot separate yourself from human tragedy, human failure, human suffering, or your own without sacrificing your own enlightenment or your own transformation. So uh, after saying that, I want to also say that it probably was inevitable. <laughs> I'm not trying to let them all off the hook. But, you know, civilization was, especially for the then four or five centuries of barbarian invasions, we needed order. We needed some kind of holding it together. Do you know, at the time of the English Reformation, they think there were 5,000 monasteries and religious houses in England. We basically owned half of the country. <laughs> Uh, religion sort of took over. We, we owned the land. There was no tax base because the monks and the nuns and the friars who collected together in, with the common purse were able to do such things. Huh? But unfortunately, and this is what St. Francis was critiquing, it also aligned us with the moneyed class. The landed gentry were much more our donors than the poor. So we lost what I'm gonna call the touchstone of orthodoxy. What keeps your gospel real is always, as Pope Francis says, going toward the periphery. Now let me tell you a little uh, historical thing which I've now checked out from historians who know more than I. Probably you younger people would not be aware that the, the Pope who was Paul VI, who was in charge at the end of uh, Vatican II, he was a very humble man, I think, and he saw the huge rebellion setting into place as we threw out the Latin Mass and all the things that the old Catholics had grown used to. And here was his strategy, very well intended. He, he knew by being in the council who the cardinals and bishops were who were fighting reform. 
So in every case, he took them out as the head of any commission or any committee. But in hopes of holding the church together, he left them on the committee. <laughs> they were not the chairman anymore, but you can document this in every single area. Those who were downright against the reforms, he thought, you know, he was going to have a team of rivals, as Lincoln would have put it. Huh? Uh, let's not punish the opposition. Let's include the opposition. Now, my nonviolent training would by and large agree with that, you know, that you don't eliminate your enemies. You pull them in and try to make friends. But what happened, and this is taking over by the mid-70s, when the freedom doors blew open in the late 60s and early 70s, the forces of resistance, little by little, set in place. And these are the forces that, that took over under John Paul II and Benedict XVI. I'm not saying they were bad men. I'm sure they're holier men than I am. But uh, their agenda was rather clear. It was to resist this new freedom. Uh, probably the church never became so centralized since Innocent III in the 13th century as it did under John Paul II. Uh, I'm not going to say that's evil, but it probably explains in great part why former Catholics, I said this to some of you yesterday, uh, former Catholics are the second biggest denomination in America. <laughs> They're not really a denomination, but you go to almost any church, and I bet it's true of a third of you in this room, uh, you'll say, oh, I was raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic. Yeah. But the immense dis disillusionment from the clericalism, the seemingly abu seeming abuse of power, just became too much for many people. So let me give you what I see. Well, not just what I see. He says this in his first, it uh, wasn't encyclical, his apostolic exhortation of how on the principal level uh, Pope Francis is trying to tear down the Berlin Wall of religion. And these are the principles that he says he's going to operate out of. What Number one, People are more important than ideas. You've got to know that's revolutionary. <laughs> and that's revolutionary for Protestants, too. I mean, we're all in this thing together. And, and I think one of the blind spots of most Protestantism is the failure to realize that if you are Protestant, you're a child of Catholicism. <laughs> and you can't deny that. That's true. Huh? And you carry our baggage, and you carry our luggage, and you can't hate your mother. <laughs> Not only did we hate our mother, but we hated our grandparents, the Jewish religion. You know, talk about getting off to a bad start, you know, anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism. No wonder they were, were called, I know Anglicans are not called this, uh, protesters. It's an it's a anti-position, do you understand? Now we needed that anti-position, but the trouble is it festered and produced 30,000 Protestant denominations worldwide. You know? So we're having in this globalization era a recognition that we're all in this together. <laughs> and to just keep tooting the, the Methodist flag or the Lutheran flag or the, is, is sort of at this point a waste of time. It's just we're all in this together. And we got to recognize that we are children of Western Christianity. As you know, I'm a founder of a center in New Mexico called the Center for Action and Contemplation. And if you want the old, solid, contemplative teaching, you've got to go to the Eastern Church, <laughs> the Eastern fathers and mothers. The Western Church was always identified with the Roman Empire, with climbing, achieving, performing, uh, the, the deep wisdom of the desert fathers and mothers, you have to go to orthodoxy to find that. So every time, every time the church divided, I think we lost a major part of Christ <laughs> by, by rejecting the previous group or the group we separated from. 
But the first big separation, of course, was 1054, where, isn't it nice, the patriarch of Constantinople and the bishop of Rome mutually excommunicated one another. Huh? Talk about a reconciling community. You know? And basically, what happens after 1054 is the two groups almost entirely ignore one another. Hmm? We learn nothing from them. We didn't study the Eastern Fathers. They didn't study the Western Fathers. We both were losers, you see. And then the, the second great break, of course, begins in the 16th century. And I want to keep saying, it had to happen. That's, that's the birth of critical thinking. But here's the problem. When you identify with the oppositional position, and opposition and rebellion and what I don't agree with becomes your primary agenda. It's a negative stance. The gospel is about what you do believe in, what you're in love with, what you care about. It's all embracing. The, the ego defines itself by constriction. The soul defines itself by expansion. And the Christianity that most of us were given was not an expansive Christianity. It was defining ourselves by what we were not. We were not Catholic, we were not black, we were not gay, we were not whatever you didn't want to be. And that's what your children and grandchildren are recognizing. I don't want to be a part of an organization that is largely exclusionary. When you begin negative, you stay negative. So Pope Francis said that his model was going to be St. Francis, who, uh, who lived what we Franciscans call, and I'm going to take a few minutes to define it, an alternative orthodoxy. We're, we were trained in what we thought was what we called orthodox theology. But here was the difference, that our emphasis was always, as you see in Pope Francis, was always practice, lifestyle, not defining the Trinity in other more refined ways are defining the hypostatic union or transubstantiation or high-level theology that the ordinary believer has no time for or no interest in. Huh? So that is what Pope Francis has retrieved. The alternative orthodoxy that I'm proud to say, I'm not saying we Franciscans always lived it, not by any means. We became establishment too. And we started getting ordained here. I'm a priest myself. And that wasn't what Francis was. He, he stayed outside of that to, to maintain his freedom. But uh, an emphasis upon orthopraxy. It might not be a word you're familiar with. You don't need to be. But orthodoxy means right belief, normally understood. Orthopraxy is right practice. Do, do you actually love the poor? Do you actually serve your neighbor? Do you actually care about people who are outside of your own group. Huh? And to me, that's the only test of whether you've had authentic God experience. So back to his principles, and I'll read them quickly now because I've, I've somewhat already illustrated them. People are more important than ideas. And then he added in a later document, facts are more important than ideas. And what he means by facts are just what is. That two-thirds of the world is starving. That's a fact. <laughs> and God cares about that fact. And he's saying that's more important than endlessly clarifying our theological subtleties. Secondly, he says, therefore the bottom is to be sought, not the top. So he got rid of all of the trappings of luxury and the papal palace and the red shoes and those might seem like little things but they've redefined the papacy as as not an imperial role he said all thrones cathedras the chair that the presider sits in is never to be fancy never to be gold when he goes to a new country he says don't put any gold on me i won't wear it all right <laughs> that might seem little it's huge it's huge because it's changing sides, do you understand? 
to identify with what the crucified Jesus identified with, which is the majority of humanity. He says that the love of power is the primary demon, not of itself, gender, race, religion, money, or even class. All those only become bad insofar as they become power games. Hmm? All of them become... And feminism can be another power game. You do know that. (laughs) You can be for a liberal cause and now use it to ensconce yourself. And we see that, of course, in Jesus' three temptations in the desert. You know, they're all temptations to the misuse of power. And what he's trying to do, just like the 12-step program does, is get the church to move back to step one. It is in my powerlessness that I come to God, not in asserting my power. So gender and race and religion and money and class are all things, thank God, we've begun to critique. But if these new liberations do not use their power for, uh, for the good of the world, but just their own enhancement, he, he says it will simply create a new kind of domination. He says that purity, the seeking of personal purity or doctrinal purity, is not just an illusion, but an an entirely false goal for the individual or for the church itself. That appeals to the ego, not to the soul, to think I am purer than you are. If you go through the Gospels, you see that every time a purity code uh, is invoked, Jesus has nothing to do with it. He will not, because it's always the attempt of one group to make itself holier than thou. I do not do this bad thing. Uh, So I I think he's very much following the Gospels. But you know, this is very embarrassing to say, but it's what we Catholics have often been criticized for. You do know we didn't read the Bible very much. (laughs) Now that isn't entirely our fault, most people couldn't read. The printing press wasn't invented till the 16th century. But it did get us off to some bad starts where people could believe all kind of fanciful things and call it the gospel when it was never there. And that's why Luther and the other reforms that maybe you represent were absolutely essential. But then, as I keep saying, then they got involved in the antagonistic position for itself and that became its own kind of problem. Another principle he invokes is that bridges are more important than boundaries. Bridges are more important than boundaries. If you look at most of the arguments of religion, they're always boundary markers. You know, always, and and conferences can go on for years, redefining the boundaries, who's in and who's out who's a real Episcopalian and who isn't. One of the things I admire about your church, and I saw it in the magnificent way you celebrated Eucharist here on Sunday, is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my Episcopal friends have told me this, that that you have defined yourself primarily as a worshiping community, not a doctrinal purity community. See, we Catholics didn't do that. It was doctrinal purity. That made us into legalists and ritualists and clericalists, this searching for, to maintain the true orthodoxy, as it were. And because we considered ourselves the mother church, well, certainly we have the pure position. Maybe, maybe not. And finally, uh, the common good is more important than the endless assertion of individual rights. You know, we live in a country that doesn't think that way. We've got an endless fight between everybody's individual rights, and hardly anybody is voting for the common good. What's good for America as a whole, even if it means my little white clerical system has to give up some of its privilege, some of its power? Tell me how many people talk that way. It's not very many. We've made an idol of individual rights. 
to the loss of what is the first principle of Catholic moral theology, which is the common good. The common good. What's good for the whole. It's going to take a lot of converting to, uh, to bring, I think, the American mind, because we're so grossly individualistic, to really transfer to what is good for the whole. So, uh, have I got any scratchings here that might be worth telling you before I open it up? Oh, just different things to be said in different times, all of which are good. But uh, I think the passion of Pope Francis is to again make love the center and the goal and the foundation. It's not just the, the, the basis on which we build everything, but it's the energy with which we proceed, and it's the goal toward which we tend. And that's what's given him a worldwide 86% popularity, <laughs> even among Muslims, among Jews, among Protestants. The world still knows an authentic human being. And when you see an authentic human being, you forget about what religion he is or what, what costume he wears or what title he holds. All you recognize is, I hope that, that love rubs off on me. And I'm sure I'm talking about many people right in front of me right now. That many of us have come to that place of, of moving beyond the usual argumentations of this or that which keep you in the negative mode and I'm sure many of you just desire with whatever remaining years we have to God just make me a loving person and the recognition in our our heart of hearts that that we're all still in kindergarten in the ways of love I know I am and and we have to expose ourselves to situations that every day shout, Richard, you do not yet know how to love. <laughs> and I, I hope I'm still hearing that the final days of my life, Richard. I don't have to succeed at it, but I have to know that I am a weak man, I am a powerless man, I am, as Pope Francis says of himself, a sinner. And from that empty space, we find ourselves very open to mercy, and to grace, and to growth, and to freedom. So let's just take a little while, and uh, you can ask me some questions. And you don't have to agree with everything I've said. Uh, if something I said didn't make any sense, Bob here is going to bring the microphone to you. Please feel free to ask me to expand on it, or explain it a little better. Thank you very much, sir, for your very invigorating lecture. But knowing that we are all in this together, as you said, I'd like to know if you think Episcopalians need to adapt more of Christ-like kindness and passion. And could you give some emphasis in respect of where we need to go? Christ-like kindness, and what was the second word you used? Passion. Passion, oh, okay. Well, you know, I'm in no position to tell Episcopalians what you should do because I'm not a living part of this community to see where you're missing the mark. Uh, my sense is, from my short time here and four years ago when I was here, uh, there seems to be an awful lot of concern for social ministry, for caring about people. I'm quite happy to see so many people of color here. Uh, that tells me... It must be an inclusive community. It must be a welcoming community. I've met several gay people since I've been here. That tells me you must be a welcoming community. Uh, so you might be farther along than you give yourself credit for. But remember, we all always fall short in love. And you don't want to use that as an excuse, not that I heard you doing that, as uh, an excuse not to belong to a group because it's not loving enough. That's a cop-out. <laughs> uh, you could all do that with your marriages after your first fight, couldn't you? Huh? She doesn't know how to love. He doesn't know how to love. No, you stay in there with unlove, and that's how you learn how to love, 
and you help them to learn too. So uh, I would say among those of us from other churches, we consider the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church in England and Canada and Australia uh, to actually be one of the more inclusive churches, one of the more uh, social justice oriented churches. So give yourself credit where credit is due. But that doesn't mean you haven't made mistakes or you don't have room for growth. We always, always will. But Please raise your hand if I can bring you the mic. Well, while you're thinking about it, may I ask one? Sure. Um, you, you talked about Francis's, uh, both Francis's emphasis on orthopraxy. Orthopraxy. Rather than orthodoxy. And um, a number of observers have said that Francis actually hasn't changed any doctrines. He, his practice is different. No. If that's true, does doctrine have to catch up at some point, or it, maybe it just doesn't matter? You know, what we really follow are, is energy. <laughs> he hasn't changed any formal doctrines. You know, it's like Jesus said in, in is it chapter 7 of the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew, where, you know, I have not come to take away any of the laws, but I want to tell you what they really mean. What is the purpose of the law? Huh? And I feel that Francis is being very true to Jesus in that. He's not going to waste time formally changing what is truly doctrine. Now, if he could last 10 years, and I'd love to pray for that, uh, maybe he could show that a lot of the things we consider doctrine really aren't. They're just practices. Huh? Let me give you a, a common example. I remember when I learned in studying systematic theology that the so-called doctrine of purgatory, where certain people were punished after they died till they got pure enough to be with God or something, that was never proclaimed as an official doctrine of the church. It was folk religion that came from the bottom, and pretty soon everybody sort of believed it. And most Catholics, including bishops, think that's a doctrine. It isn't. <laughs> never was. You know? There's, if I had longer to be with you and could give you a systematic course, I could list 25 things like that that you perhaps think are doctrines and are not at all. Thomas Aquinas, who was certainly not a Catholic lightweight, he said the actual beliefs of the Catholic Church are very few. And he underlined in Latin, very few. It isn't a big uh, system of beliefs. It's, remember Jesus himself says it, to love God and love your neighbor includes all of the law and the prophets as well. Now, if I said that without quoting Jesus, there'd be bishops in New York and New Jersey who would be after my tail. But thank God I can say, well, I'm just quoting Jesus. You know? <laughs> but we let Jesus get away with it. Now, we really don't believe Jesus, but we, we wouldn't dare say that that isn't true. Go ahead. So how, did, how will the Catholic Church carry out the Pope's instructions on climate change, and did St. Francis himself have a doctrine of ecology? I missed two words in there. Of what change? Uh, how will the Catholic Church yeah. carry out the Pope's instructions on climate change. Climate change, I'm sorry. And, and did St. Francis have a doctrine of ecology? It's St. Francis, oh. Well, certainly St. Francis is the patron of ecology, and of course in the 13th century he had no idea where this was gonna lead. But he, he became the great symbol right in the 13th century when we are moving from an agricultural economy to the beginnings of trade and merchandising and, and so forth. And his own father, as you perhaps know, if you know his life, was a tradesman. Francis illustrates a dramatic protest against that, huh? almost as if he saw where it was gonna go. So Francis Moore lays the foundation by his love of, of creation, uh, animals, brother, son, sister, moon. Uh, he just weaves a beautiful vision of the unity of all being. It wasn't anthropocentric. And he's the only person recorded to have granted subjectivity to animals and elements. 
that he would talk to them as if they had dignity, as if they had rights, as if they could talk back to him. Now, those of you who are animal lovers like I am, that probably makes a lot of sense. But we come from centuries of brutal treatment of the earth and of animals. And so to turn this around and to really honor the dignity of every level of creation is going to be a major, major transformation of consciousness. Uh, now, it's going to be necessary for our, our own survival, I think. But probably, and I hate to be so cynical, but probably until it's forced on us, until the water starts rising in this end of Manhattan, and you're always on the maps, you know, this is where the water's going to rise, uh, I don't think we'll take it seriously. Remember, what the ego resists is change. We will find any excuse we can rather than change. So I, I hope, they said he was a major, his document, Laudato Si, was a major influence at the Paris conference, which, which is still going on, isn't it? Yeah, it's still going on. Uh, but how do we communicate that urgency to the normal man or woman on the street here? I bet it's going to take a catastrophe. I bet it is. That's the only way we get it, when we get whomped on the side of the head. Now, is, is the catastrophe going to be too far down the line that we can't pull it back? I think that's our fear, you know, that it'll be too late. Um, but we, if you read Laudato Si, and you really should, it's a courageous document, you know? <laughs> and he certainly... Um, uh, got advice from people at many different levels of science and economy. And uh, much that he says, let's be honest, flies in the face of American worldviews and American politics. So you probably won't hear a lot of bishops or priests preaching about it. Because when it comes down to it, and I'm speaking of us too, I'm not trying to speak of someone else, we're more Americans than we are Christians. We are. We're more Americans than we are Christians. And that's what formed our psyche. That's the worldview of trickle-down economics and things like that, that, that we just, oh yeah, that's got to be true because Reagan said it's true and he's, he was president, you know. Well, Pope Francis just says it's malarkey, you know. <laughs> Only the rich could believe such silliness. But no one else could talk that way except the Pope and get away with it. Uh, and just speak directly in opposition to some of our attitudes toward refugees, toward the economy, and toward the earth. Thank you. Are we here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Richard. I'm, I'm going to ask something a little more personal. You, didn't, right. you didn't really get much of an introduction, so um, I would say if I were introducing you, I've been, I grew up in New York, I've been a lifelong New Yorker, I've been a Christian for 60 years, and your writings and your talks over the last couple of decades have meant more to me than almost wow. anyone else. So thank you, first thank of all, you. for that and for being here. I, I would like to know from your perspective, you've really pushed on a lot of things. You've really, um, I mean, Breathing Underwater and the Great Themes of St. Paul, just my two, two of my favorite. What would you consider your primary legacy? Your, if you were to be remembered for one primary teaching, what would wow. you point out to us? Well, you know, now this is just what comes to mind now. I don't know if I'd say it after an hour of thought, but uh, you perhaps, heard, if you've been listening to me for some time, you know, I say St. Francis and Therese of Lisieux are my favorite saints. And the reason they are is because they, more than any other saints, had the courage to teach a spirituality of imperfection. That we come to God through our wrongness, not through our rightness. You've got to know that's revolutionary. It changes everything. Huh? And why I, I speak so much of the 12 steps, even though I've never been a formal member, maybe I should be, of a 12-step program, uh, is because Bill Wilson got that by the first step. Yeah? I have to admit I am powerless. Yeah? I think that's the gospel, pure and simple. <laughs> and it's why we start, as the Episcopalians do too, 
start the liturgy with, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. It's like a public admission that we're all weak and powerless. Your ticket to being here is not your worthiness, it's your unworthiness, damn it. <laughs> and the ego doesn't like to hear that. Huh? And this is another thing that Pope Francis is, is saying to the, uh, the bishops and priests, that the sacraments are not prizes for the perfect. And he says the church should be a field hospital on the edge of the battlefield. Wow. Huh? And that you come here not because you've earned any worthiness or you're better than those people out there on the street. You come here because you know you need medicine. That's, that's the heart of... If I can bring back some of that message of Paul's when I'm weak is when I'm strong. So this is Paul already too, you know. But it pretty much got lost between the 4th century and the 14th century. There's no, it's all, no, I'm not saying there weren't saints. I'm not saying there weren't holy people. I'm not saying there weren't people who went to heaven, if you want to think that way. Uh, probably people better than I. But as a, a corporate institutional movement, we were raised on a spirituality of climbing and perfection. How could I be morally worthy? And on this, forgive me, Protestantism did not reform us. You did not reform us. It was the same thing all over again, and Protestantism in many ways became more puritanical than we were <laughs> in its worst forms, more moralistic and legalistic than sometimes we were. So that's why I say we're all in this together, and let's not waste time po poking fingers at, at one another. Thank you. That was very kind of you. One more, do you think? Or I don't mind. I enjoy talking. Yes. Father Roar, you, I, I'm curious to know your thoughts about the Pope's 15 ailments about the Curia that he wrote yes. last year. I thought that was such a powerful document. I, I thought it was unprecedented. I related to quite a few of the ailments myself, so I wonder what your thoughts are about it. You know, I wish I had it in front of me. What she's referring to, that was last Christmas, wasn't it? Yeah. He got the Curia, the royal court, all these cardinals, and he frankly reamed them out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. He exposes their worst sins. I'm sure he lost a lot of friends that day, and they said, my God, we elected this guy. But if you want a parallel, read Matthew 23. So his... His speech last Christmas to the cardinals would be paralleled by what Jesus says about the scribes and the Pharisees. You are whited sepulchers, <laughs> you don't obey the law yourself, and then you put burdens on the lay people that you wouldn't carry yourself. Uh, you couldn't get much stronger than Jesus. And Francis, I think, being a pope and a prophet, had the courage to talk that way. I'm sorry I don't have it here in front of me, but thanks for at least mentioning it. And I'm sure you can find it online. His scathing critique of the Roman clerical system. It's uh, pretty devastating. Hi. Um, I was interested in what you said about uh, kind of orthodoxy v. orthopraxy. Um, I'll try and be really brief. I'm from a background where orthodoxy was really important. Uh, little independent evangelical church, very specific ideas about uh, what the atonement is, a baptism, who goes to heaven, da da da. From an evangelical theology? Yeah. Or? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, they became more concerned with orthodoxy than even we were. It well, I know. Very interesting. Very but we interesting. don't admit it. <laughs> um, and uh, I have kind of moved a lot more broad in my head over 30 years. Um, but I think it's very easy for all of us who come from that background yeah. to retreat to that and feel that secretly that might actually be true and not have the freedom of love is the biggest thing. Yeah. How do you cure that? <laughs> An easy question. Oh, there's a number of points I'll make. I'll try to make them quickly. 
uh, but I hope sincerely. First of all, don't hate yourself too much. It didn't sound like you were. The easiest place to begin is with a container, conservative, right? I began a conservative Catholic boy in Kansas, all right? <laughs> Couldn't have gotten much more conservative. And in a certain sense, I can draw a straight line from my conservative beginnings to the way I talk now. Because being an insider into that world preoccupied with orthodoxy, you start seeing very early that it doesn't hold together that it's filled with deceit and delusion. And then when I was able to study systematic theology and scripture, then I had the, the, the uh, tools to really critique it and so forth. So first of all, thank God for your evangelical beginnings. It's a great place to start. You know, one of my publishers, Jossie Bass, who put out Falling Upward and Immortal Diamond, they told me this was two years ago, I don't know if it's still true, my single biggest demographic that, that read my books, from them at least, is young evangelical males. Not Catholics. Young evangelical males just eat up some of my stuff. Because they see that I am scriptural, and of course you've got to prove your credit by being scriptural, but I think it's because we came from the same place of a kind of calm, the conservatism I grew up with in the 1950s was not angry like it is today. It was just, we were just pious little naive innocent people who lived in our own ghettos as we all did in Kansas. And you didn't know anybody who wasn't Catholic or wasn't white. Uh, but we had nobody to hate. My parents were not racist. Uh, it was really wonderful that what a loving world I did grow up in. But it was still, it almost happened by accident because the actual teaching we were given was so narrow, was so self-serving, all about boundaries, not about bridges. So I was just lucky that I got my education, college in the early 60s, theology in the late 60s, when the whole thing was blowing open. And I had the tools to help me to try to understand that. So evangelicalism is an excellent place to start as long as there's enough love in the family and in the community. It's not a good place to continue. <laughs> and it's an even worse place to stop because, because you don't know all that you could be open to. You know, when, when Paul says in Galatians 5, for freedom Christ has set us free. What did we, we lost Galatians almost entirely. You were created for freedom, he says. You weren't created to obey laws. Paul was the apostle of freedom and we made him into a cheap moralist, we really did. So we're in this place now where all of us together are rediscovering the freedom of the children of God. Huh? And, but now we're not gonna waste time like the former reformations did, wasting 30 years proving why the previous group is wrong, you know, or 30 years proving that your childhood church was wrong. Yeah. You're going to be able to thank you, God, that I was born an evangelical. I thank God I was born a conservative Roman Catholic. But I've been exposed to grace and growth that allows me, as we say, in, to transcend but to include. You don't rebel against the previous stages. You include, 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 include. You don't play the victim. You don't make victim of other people. When you're outside the victim game, and I will stop on this, playing the victim and creating victims, you're liberated. Huh? And you don't have to make anybody else the victim so you can be right and wonderful. You don't have to put down anybody else. And neither do you play the victim for your own power, which is half of America, I would say. When you, you don't do that anymore, you're free. The soul is free, the mind is free, the heart is free. So, thank you. And forgive me for the things I said poorly or, or uh, wrongly. Uh, I have to trust that grace and goodness will fill in the gaps. Thank you.
Thank you, Richard Rohr. I want to uh, let you all know that uh, we are selling copies of Eager to Love in the back, uh, right at that counter, right back there. And Richard will be signing them right up here if you'd like. Or if you have another book, or a cast, or your cheek, or something else you'd like him to sign, please bring that up, and he'd be happy to. Thank you all. Have a great night. Have a great night. Thank you for coming. Good. I'll just stay right here. Yep.